Thanks for joining us today. Our hope is that you're greatly encouraged by today's message and inspired to saturate our city and our world with God's heart. Well, this morning, I, as, as we start this new series entitled Values, I want to talk to you about why we do Feed the Multitudes and some of the other things that we do around here. Um, values and vision are some things that people at churches don't feel like they need to pay attention to because it sounds like something like an organization or a business might do. But here at Beverly Christian Center, we believe in our vision. I want everyone to point to where the vision is written. Just go ahead and point. Go ahead and point. Very good. Some people aren't pointing. Look it around you and see where people are pointing. It's out in the foyer. It's on the walls. And it says, saturating our city and our world with the heart of God. We cannot say that enough because our vision is what we do. Everything we do is tied to our vision. So what are our values as we go into this new series? What are our values? Our values tell you who we are. I do the membership class, and one of the questions I ask everyone that comes here, I say, how did you find out about Bellevue Christian Center? For new people, they tell me how they found out. And I say, well, what keeps you here? And they, tells me, they tell me what brought them back. But for you, those of you who've been here a long time, if someone were to ask you, what's Bellevue Christian Center all about? What would you say? If, if, they, would, if, they, would, if they would say, just, just give me in, a, in, a, in bullet form or in two sentences, tell me what Bellevue Christian Center is all about. And over the next four weeks, we're going to tell you that. We're going to fill in that blank for you. We're going to give you the values who tell you exactly who we are. We call them our core four. There are four values that we have, and we call them our core four. And these values, they clarify for us exactly what Bellevue Christian Center is all about. They guide us in what we do and what we don't do. Uh, Many people, they will come to myself or one of the other pastors and say, why don't we do this? Or why don't we do that? Sometimes we say, that's a good idea. We can do that. Sometimes we say, well, we just don't feel called that that's what God has us to do. Because each church in a community has a unique, everyone say unique, a unique character, a a unique personality in the community. And that helps us from fighting with each other because what new life does is minister to a part of the community. And what we do is minister to to a part of the community. If everybody, if all the churches did the same thing, then there would be things that would not get done because no church can do everything. Church family, Beverly Christian Center cannot be everything to everybody. So our core four helps you understand who we are and helps you explain to other people what we do. And what we hope is if you are familiar with satellites, if you could picture our vision saturating our city with the heart, and the world with the heart of God as one satellite and our values, the core four, as the other satellite, and they always are telling us where we are and what we're doing. And when we find we're doing something that's outside of that vision or those values, then we find we're out of place. So this morning, we're going to kick off the series and we're going to talk about the first value. But first, I want to give you all four of our core four. The first one is we value people. And we're going to go into some detail on that today. Second is we value the presence of God. Uh, Worship, prayer, the preaching of the Word. We value, it is important to us that all of us have an opportunity to dwell in the presence of God. Number three, we value authentic Christianity. That means the, the study of God's Word. And through the study of God's Word, allowing that Word to transform us into, image, into the image of Christ. Our goal, our value, what we're about is about you being as much as close to being like Christ as you can be, and me being the same. And then finally, we value advancing the kingdom. Uh, people who come here say, Pastor, why do you guys do so much missions work? Because we value advancing the kingdom. We value everything we do pointing to expanding, enlarging God's kingdom. So let's go to our first value as we kick off this series, and it's called We Value People. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your heart for us. 
And God, I know today you have a message for each and every person in this room. God, you want to speak to us. You want to encourage us. You want to challenge us right where we are. So this morning, as I attempt to share your heart about people, Father, I pray that the Spirit of God would hone in on each and every one of us and move us a little closer to you when it comes to how you feel about people. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say, amen. The first value we want to talk about is we value people, meaning we are passionate about welcoming, about including, and nurturing all people in godly relationships, leading to true Christian community. When we talk about valuing people, you need to look at that last statement. The reason I value you is because I believe you should be a part of Christian community. The reason we value people who come here for the first time is we want them to know that we want them to be a part of Christian community. So let's go back and talk about value. What does that word value mean? We value people. That word value means we place a supreme importance on people. Not just people I like, not just people you like, Not just people who sit next to you, who sit in your hood. (laughs) Not just people who look like you. Not just people who sound like you. Not just people who are of your same gender. Not just people of your same color. But we value all people. We place a supreme importance on loving all people. We, We place a worth on each and every life. And then it goes on to say, not only do we value people, but we are passionate. If I ask you, those of you who know me in a personal way, you would say, if I ask you, what is Pastor Hooker passionate about? What would you say? Who? Kissing people. I am. I'm very passionate (laughs) about kissing people. It's important to me. Very good. What else is Pastor Hooker passionate about? I got an answer here, his wife, so we'll hold on to that one. Yeah, that's a good answer there. (laughs) The Cowboys, I'm passionate about America's team. I I mean, if you're going to talk about football, we're going to talk about the flag, we're going to talk about apple pie, and we're going to talk about America's team. I mean, it just just naturally flows out of me. I'm passionate. there's There's no excuses. I don't apologize for it. I love me some Dallas Cowboys. I'm passionate. What else is Pastor Hooker passionate about? Barbecue. I'm telling you, it doesn't get too cold. It doesn't get too hot. It's never too early. It's never too late to put some fire on some meat for me. Now, each and every one of us have things that we're passionate about. What are you passionate about? What, what stirs you on the inside? What gets you going? What causes your mouth to salivate? What, what, what causes your, your, your neurons and, and electrons to fire off in you when, when you start thinking about doing it? Those are the things that you're passionate about. And at Bellevue Christian Center, we are passionate. We are excited about you. I'm excited about you. I'm excited. Those of you who who are here for the first time today, we are excited about you. And that's our passion. We express our passion to people in lots of ways. So we want to give people worth. And Jesus modeled this for us. The Father modeled this for us. The Holy Spirit modeled this for us because people are created in the Father's image. Jesus Christ came. Jesus Christ left home to come to earth to live as a man because he was passionate about people. Now, was he passionate just about people who loved him? Was he just passionate about people who he knew would follow him? Or did Jesus have a passion about people who hated him? Yes, he did. He was passionate about all people, and that's what we love about him. So when we talk about our vision is to love people, 
I want you to write this down. Our goal is not to see how much we can get from people. When we talk about being passionate about people, our goal is not to see how much I can get from you, but to see how much I can give to you. See, Jesus Christ was passionate about you because he didn't come to see what we could give him. He came because he had something to give us. As a church, we want to live a life that says the reason I love people is because I'm not looking for them to give me anything. I'm looking to give them what Christ has given me. Christ has given me his spirit. Christ has given me his love. And I want to give that to other people. I want us to be people who say, I love people and I want to give it away. Now, in saying that, I want to apologize because at Berry Christian Center, we might have a value of loving people, but you know what? We don't always get it right. Sometimes we say things. Sometimes we do things. Sometimes when I go on Facebook, I read things from you that break my heart, that break a pastor's heart when I see our acts of love toward other people. So as one of your pastors this morning, I want to apologize for for us as a church if we don't always get it right because we're growing, (laughs) we're maturing, and our desire is to be like Christ. So in your walk with Christ, if if you consider Beverly Christian Center a home, your home, you need to probably apologize to Sue and say, God, forgive me because sometimes I don't get this valuing people right. I, I don't see it. I don't do it. I don't, I don't express it. I don't, I'm not passionate about people the way you are. And I know that, that that's not the way you want me to be. So, God, I ask you to forgive me for not loving everybody, my enemies, those who curse me, those who hate me, those who say I'm too loud. God, forgive me for not loving them with the same love that you have for people. Our heart, hear me, church, our heart is to value all people with the love of Jesus Christ. Thomas Moynihan, he was the inventor, the creator, the executive, uh, the chief CEO of Domino's Pizza. Domino's Pizza uh, is the second largest pizza company in America. And they were interviewing Mr. Moynihan, and the interviewer asked him, what do you attribute your high success? Why is Domino's so successful with this product? And Mr. Moynihan replied, we are about programming everything for growth. And the interviewer said, well, well, you know, Mr. Moore, what do you mean? What do you mean by programming everything for growth? Every day, Mr. Moynihan says, we develop people. Everything we do in growth is tied to people. It's not about our crust. It's not about our secret sauce. It's not how, about how fast we deliver, but it's about how we develop people. And those of you who are familiar with Domino's, you know that their slogan is, our most important ingredient is people. I believe, like Mr. Moynihan with Domino's Pizza, God's most important ingredient is people. And I believe at Beverly Christian Center, we want our heart, we want to express that same mantra, is that we believe that people are the most important important thing. How God loves people, how we love people is the most important thing. Now, all of us in our priorities, we have certain things that are important to us. My family, my grandkids, uh, prayer, giving to the church, fellowship, how I do my job, all those things are important to me. But God says, hook In 1 Corinthians 13, 3, listen to what he says. He says, if you give everything you own to the poor, if you give everything you possess to the poor, and if you give your body to be burned, 
and you don't have love, it's a zero. See, all this stuff we do, everything Barry Christian Center has, everything Barry Christian Center does, feed the multitude, we could feed 840 million people. But if we're doing it to get our name in the paper, it's a zero. If we're doing it for, for, for our gratitude, to ingratiate ourselves, God says, it's a zero. It profits us nothing. Church, everything you do, everything I do, in answer to our Father, is filtered by God's love. If we don't operate in God's love, he says, it profits us nothing. It profits us nothing. I love what it says in Matthew. God says that we're to love him. We're to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, and all our mind. That's the first commandment. And the second is like that, that we're to love others as we love ourselves. Do you understand what God is trying to tell us? Folks, it doesn't matter if, if we are not wrapped up in the love of God in everything we say and do, it's not going to profit anything. So this morning, I want to look at Romans 13, 7, and I believe, we're going to start at verse 7, I believe today this passage, Romans 13, 7 through 10, will move us from dead center. For some of us, we're, we're sitting, and we said, Pastor, what does this look like? Uh, how do I do it? I believe today, if we, if, if we would open our hearts to the Holy Spirit, He's going to challenge us in a way like we've never been challenged when it comes to loving people. And it's going to show us a picture of God like we've never seen when it comes to how he loves people. Let's look at Romans 13, verses 7 through 10. Now, prior to this, we know Paul is talking to the Romans about how they need to honor and reverence governmental authorities because they've been placed there by God. Paul wants us to know that we meet, need to be submissive to our rulers and that we need to pay our taxes and respect the public office. That we are not to owe anything when it comes to taxes, but we are to be fair and upright with government leaders. Now read with me Romans 13 verse 7. Give to everyone what you owe them. That's a negative. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Okay, he's setting that, that umbrella for us. Now, in verse 8, owe nothing to anyone. Now, I can go on a whole series on what that means as far as debt. There's good debt and there's bad debt. Good debt is, is when you owe and pay your installments correctly, and then there's a return. Like houses, hopefully you get a return on your investment. That's a good, that's good debt. College loans, that's good debt. Hopefully you get a return. Credit cards, bad debt. Oh, no one, nothing. So, so here he's talking about don't get in debt that you cannot pay. Now listen, that's the negative. Now he goes to the positive. Don't owe anyone anything except for your obligation to love one another. Underline, highlight, Bold. I want you to hear what God is saying to us this morning, church. Except for your obligation to love one another. It's an obligation. I am indebted. We've read that scripture, but we haven't understood it like this. You and I are indebted to each other. Some of you are happy to say, Pastor Luka, I'm out of debt. No, you're not, because you owe me. You owe me. Pastor, what do you mean? You owe me because today you have to love me. And you know what? No matter how much you love me today, guess what? Tomorrow you're going to be in debt to me again. You cannot pay your debt of love to me. And guess what? I can't pay my debt. I, today I have, to, I have to pay it, but it's never done. We know about the debt we owe Christ. Christ died for us. We're indebted to him. We don't have eternal life without it, but you know what? I'm indebted to people because 
just what Paul says. It is an ongoing indebtedness. It's an obligation. Church, everyone that comes through those doors, I don't care what they look like. I don't care where they come from. I don't care what they feel about the church. I don't care how they look at you, how they look at me. God says we are indebted. We are obligated to love them. You are obligated. You are in debt in love. And as I was reading this and studying, I said, God, this is, this, is, this is a whole different picture for me when it comes to how I love people. And see, when you understand that, that you're loving people out of, an, out of a debt that you owe them, then it keeps you from, from loving them based upon what they can do for you. See, I owe Wells Fargo Mortgage Company for my house. I'm indebted to them. And I pay them not because of what they're going to do for me. <laughs> They've done it. They, they took care of my house. The reason I love you, the reason you love me, it's not based upon getting anything from me. Some of you, you got some people in your life, you decide you're not going to love them because they didn't do things the way you wanted it done. You just wrote them off. You said, why am I going to love you? You don't, lo you don't love me. And God says, uh-uh. Your love is not based upon what they can do for you. And Beverly Christian, our value, our value in loving people, everyone that comes through those doors, we want to show them how much we love them. We want to express our hearts. We want to be passionate about them. And if I can't be passionate in my love for the people in this room, how am I going to be passionate for those people that God brings to us? Man, I should be getting a whole lot of amens and hallelujahs. Man, this is good preaching. Hey, Amen. Praise the Lord, Pastor. Look, preach it. That's good stuff. We need to work on our love. We need to exercise that love muscle. See, see too often... Our love is a lust. Our love is self-gratifying. Our, our love is based upon what it's going to get from me. I remember when I met my wife. Yes, yeah, sister, it was lust. It was total nothing but what you could. I, I mean, you were just gorgeous. And I, yes, yes. I'm sorry, you are gorgeous. Continue to be gorgeous. Always been gorgeous. Always will be gorgeous. But my love for you was based upon what you could do for me. You know, I'm walking around campus, and I got this fine chick on my arm, buddy. I'm looking pretty good. It was all about me. And it was not until I met Jesus that I realized, Hook, you got to change. Because too often the way you love people is what they can give you, what they can do for you. And God says, no, that's not the way we do it in the kingdom of God. He wants us to love people, to be indebted to one another, to carry on an obligation that cannot be fulfilled. Listen, it's not just something I do today, but I do it tomorrow. As I was preparing for this message, I just thought about last week's message as we were talking about this over that and talking about others over self. This is right where we are again. I, I just think God wants to get it into us, Beverly Christian Center, that we got to be the kind of people that will grow and exercise love. Now, then he goes on to give us a beautiful picture here of this love. Now, listen, listen to how he, how he paints this picture for us. Verse 8, owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. See, when we move into the New Testament, when we move into grace, he says, the way I love people fulfills the law. And then he goes on in verse 9. For the commandment says, you must not commit adultery. Well, if I love my wife, if I love this other woman, it won't be an issue. He says, you must not murder. If I love this person, I wouldn't dare take their life. 
if I'm, if I'm concerned about what I can give them versus what I can take away from them, I would never take their life. I wouldn't take, I wouldn't steal from someone because I love them. My, my goal in life, your goal in life, our goal in loving people is to invest and give to them and not steal from them. I'm not going to lust after what someone else has because I want to add to what they have. I want to rejoice in what they have. I don't want to covet. And when we love, it says these and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. This one commandment is all wrapped up. It's all wrapped up. Everything I do, everything I do for Christ is all wrapped up in my love for him. There is a debt that you and I must pay every day. And yet, at the same time, we must go on owing every day. There's a debt that we pay every day, but at the same time, there's a debt that we go on owing every day. And the reason we go on paying this debt every day is because it's the law. The reason I love today and the reason I go on loving you today is because it's the law. It's the law of the New Testament that we love one another. Now, I want you to think about this. I can tell you I'm a Christian, and you can see my church attendance. You can watch and I give pay on Sundays. You can watch how I talk. There's things you can watch about that I do, and you say, well, I think he's a Christian. But you know what? If there's any doubt in your mind, my relationship with Christ, how can you tell? It's how I treat you. See, it doesn't matter all that other stuff. You can, you can, you can estimate that I'm a Christian. I can estimate that you're a Christian by the things you do. But when you look at how I love you, and you look at how I love other people, it's a dead giveaway every time. What am I saying? I'm saying some of us, we put a whole lot of weight on what we do and what we don't do. We judge ourselves and we judge other people in the kingdom of God by the things they do and the things they don't do. I would submit to you today a greater indicator of my relationship with Jesus Christ other than the things I do and I don't do is how I treat you. And there's a whole lot of people outside those doors on the other side of that bridge, and they're pointing at us and saying, no, nah, you, you, you go to church. Yeah, yeah you, you, you sit up in that church every week, and, and you give the church money, but you don't love me. You know, you, there, there's people who, you, who you're going to go to work with this week. Guess what? You're going to see them this week, five days. You're going to see them at the water cooler. They're going to be in the next cubicle. You, they're going to be people who, who you work for, people who work for you, people who you got issues with, and you're going to be trying to tell them about your relationship with God. And they're going to say, uh-uh, I don't know. I don't know because you, you I, I don't see that love pouring out of you that you talk about. And that's the greatest mark against the church in America is what comes out of our mouth versus how we live is not consistent. When we go across that bridge, people are looking to see if we love them. Does your neighbors, does your neighbor know you love them? Does the person who lives right next to you, do they know that you love them? Well, I don't know because I don't even know who they are. <laughs> are there people at work who know that you are invested in them, yeah. that you care about them, that you don't want anything from them, but you are there to pour into their life? Are there people in your life who are not in the kingdom of God who would say, that individual knows God? Every Christian center, our value is we love people. And we're passionate about how we do that. We're passionate about how we do that. In our definition of we value people, it goes on to say that we're passionate, we're passionate 
about welcoming. What, what, is, what are we talking about, about welcoming? Welcoming means that when people come, at Berry, we're prepared to meet them. That, that we got our stuff in order, that when they come in, our hearts are ready to greet them with love. That, that when they cross that bridge, that, that our parking lot says, this is a place for you. Welcoming. When people come to my house, I want them to know that, that we are ready for them, that, 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 that you are not an obstruction, you are not an inconvenience for me, but you are welcome. Many people come to my house. The first time they come, they ring the doorbell. Normally I tell them, when you come back the next time, you don't need to ring the doorbell, just come on in. And they said, Pastor Luca, I, I can't do that. They said, well, what if we see something? I said, you see something, then you just, just go back out. <laughs> don't worry about it. I'm okay. But this, you're welcome. Come on in. We're family. Welcoming. And our church, we want to be welcoming. If you would do me a favor, for some of you, I want to invite you to be a part of our welcoming ministry. Down at your feet, we have these connection cards. And I want you to do this. If you find yourself, you say, man, I got some hospitality. I, I know how to, how to look people in the eye and express my love to them. I want you to fill this out on the front. Give us your information. And then on the back, it says other. And there's three things you can put in that, in that line. You can put parking lot, which means you want to be out in the parking lot loving on people as they come in. I need some young men to help me in the parking lot. Right now, our, our parking lot ministry is, is, is set up by Master's Commission. We well, guess what? Master's Commission is not here every weekend. Master's Commission is not here in the summer. And then our ministry dies. I need some people here today to say, Pastor Hooker, I want to be a part of what happens in the, in the parking lot. Well, what do they do in the parking lot? Well, when you see elderly, needing help, getting out, that's what you're there for. You help people park. You show our guests where to park. You show seniors where to park. When it's raining, you got umbrellas. You, you're helping people know, we're prepared for you. Welcome. Then it says, not only are we passionate about welcoming, we're passionate about including. What's including mean? Including means that you can be a part here. When you come to the Beverly Christian Center, we got a place for you. What does that mean? It means we want you to be a part of our, our church. We want you to be a member. Many people come and say, Pastor, why don't you guys talk about membership? Because we don't want to push people away to think that we're just about getting your, line, your name on the line. That's not what it's about. But we believe in membership. We want you to be a part. We want you to be a part of us. We want you to be with us. On the back of this card, on your connection card, it says church membership. You can check that and say, Pastor Hooker, it's been way too long. And then also it says serving opportunities. You can check that. You say, well, Pastor Hooker, I want to be a member, but man, I'm not doing anything. Pastor, I just attend and, and I understand if I'm going to love people, I need to be about loving people. I need to do something. And I believe the Holy Spirit is talking to people in this room right now. You, you're here, you call Beverly Christmas Center your home, but what are you doing? What are you doing to allow the love that God has placed in you to be expressed to other people? On this card, you can check membership and serving our opportunities. That talks about including. And then it says nurturing. What are we talking about about nurturing? Nurturing is a deeper step. Nurturing is about can we grow together? Yeah, we're prepared for, for people coming in. Yeah, we want to include you, but we don't want to stop there. We want to grow in Christian community. I want you to think about Jesus. Jesus had 70 individuals he called his disciples. And I want you to look at it in, in like concentric rings. And he had these 70 people who traveled with him and they knew him. But then there were these 12 disciples that he handpicked himself. And they hung out with him. He tasked them. They shared. He shared his heart with them. But then there was these three disciples. Notice the rings, 70, 12, 3. Peter, James, and John, they were at the Mount of Transfiguration when, when they saw, saw Jesus' countenance change. They, they were in the Garden of Gethsemane when, when right before, hours before he would lay his life down. They were with him when he went in to pray for this, this dead little girl and, and, and saw her be raised to death. They were close to Jesus. And then there was the one called John, and the Scripture says in several places, this was the, the disciple that he loved. And I want you to picture 
these circles, these relationships that Jesus had. I believe each and every one of us need to have some concentric circle relationships. See, as a pastor, I cannot have a John relationship with every one of you. As much as that might be what I want, well, let me not lie. I don't want a John relationship with every one of you. <laughs> I couldn't do it. it. It would kill me. But there are people that I have this John relationship. There are people that you have a John relationship. Then there's the, the three relationship. Then there's the seven. There's all of us that have, should have these concentric rings in our life of people who we are doing nurturing with. We're growing with. We're becoming more like Christ with. That's how we take care of each other here at Bellevue Christian Center. All of us, no one of us is taking care of everybody, but everybody is being taken care of. How's your rings doing? How are your concentric rings doing? Are you loving on people at a deep level to say that we're growing together? Are we, are we, are we walking this thing out together? I love that word. We didn't say nurture. We said nurturing. It's, a, it's an ongoing process. It's, it's, it's not something that, that, that we start and we stop. But we realize it's, it's, it's a part of who we are. It's a part of becoming more like Christ. How's your nurturing going? If I, if you, if I would ask you the first question, do you consider Berry Christian Center your home? And you would say yes. Would you say that you're being nurtured here? And if you say yes, then I'd ask you, what kind of circles do you have? How's those circles going? Well, Pastor Luka, I don't, I, don't, I don't really run in circles. <laughs> you need to run in some circles. You need to have some people in your life. You, you, need, you need people to love you, and you need people to love. We're going to get ready to participate in communion. If you don't have emblems, just raise your hand, and the ushers... Just raise your hand and the ushers will take care of you. We have some people over here on the front row. Over here and over here, just get your hands up. I love communion because communion is about the body of Christ. It's, it's, about, it's about how we love each other together. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and you can go ahead and play. Everyone to stand to your feet. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to listen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul was talking about communion, he was bothered by the church. Because when they came together for Passover, which is why they did communion in conjunction with Passover, when they came together, they had a problem. Because the rich people would come and bring food, and the poor people wouldn't have enough food to eat. So what would happen is all the rich people would be over here having a great time and the poor people would not be taken care of. That bothered Paul. That bothered God. Because that didn't show that that body was loving on each other. Furthermore, they would break out the wine and they would get drunk and unruly and they would not demonstrate the love in the body of Christ that God needed. So this is what I want to do. We're going to participate in communion this morning. And this is what I want you to do. If you're here with your family, I want you to gather together. Just go ahead and get in circles, get together. If you're here by yourself, I want you to find someone else. But I want us to get in circles together. Go ahead and get in groups. I don't want anybody by themselves. Just look around. If you see someone by themselves, give them the eyes. They come over and join me. And I won't continue until I see everybody with someone. And that way we can stay here a little longer. Brother Daryl. Find someone. I want everyone to be together, no one alone, because we're the body of Christ and we're loving on each other. Everybody, we all together? Good. It's awesome. We're the body of Christ. Look around and express your love to one another. Just go ahead. You might not know them, ask them their name. You might know them in, in a deep way. Go ahead. Just tell them how much you love them. It's their family. Go ahead. Just express, express love to each other. Go ahead. See, communion is about the body. It's about us loving each other. It's about us being one. It's about us caring about each other because of what Christ has done for us. Isn't it great? 
Oh, God, I pray that you would just bless us, that we would love. God, I pray that your love would flow through this place, that people in this room right now who need an expression of love would receive it. God, husbands and wives, children, God, I guess you're here today. God, I pray today that they would sense the love of Jesus Christ in this room. I sent some husbands because of some things you said before we do communion. You need to look at that woman and say, forgive me. Some of you wives in here, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You need to look at, you need to look at that, that man and say, I'm wrong. Will you forgive me? It's okay. That's what we do. That's how we grow. That's how we nurture in love. Families, your homes haven't been what you want them to be, and there's tension in the home. Look at each other and say, this, this is not what God wants for us. We want more for our homes. This is what God wants from us, church. God wants us as, as families to be indebted to each other in love. The Scripture says on that night in which he was to be betrayed, families are together, people are together loving on each other. He said this, he took a bread and he broke it. He says, this is my body which is broken for you. And then he invited us to do this in remembrance of him. Can we partake together? All this he did for people. He suffered brutally for people. And then in like manner, he took a cup, which symbolized his spilled blood, which bring, brings us into right relationship with him. No matter where we're coming from, no matter what our sin, it's the blood of Jesus Christ. that covers our sin. Father, this morning, I ask you to cover the sin of Beverly Christian Center. For the ways that we failed our community, for the ways at time we've made it about something other than people. God, I ask you to forgive us on our jobs. Forgive us in our neighborhoods. Forgive us on the ball field. Forgive us when we're at Walmart, when the customer service is not what we expect it to be. Forgive us for the words that come out of our mouths that hurt and scar people. God, it's your blood today that we're appropriating to our sin, to our failures when it comes to our obligation to love people. Father, forgive us. And we ask you to challenge us to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's partake together. See, Jesus, he didn't die on the cross. He didn't go through all this that we just shared for carpet, although we have pretty carpet. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't die and lay his life down for a parking lot, for beautiful screens and lights. He didn't do it. He didn't give his life for a coffee bar. Jesus spilled his life for people in which I am indebted and you're indebted and we're indebted to people and not stuff, church. Beverly Christian Center, let's love hard. I challenge you to love hard.
And let's start right here. This, the, the, they said that they will know us by our love for each other. Let's love, let's, let's make it a point that we're going to be indebted to each other, obligated to each other in such a way there's nothing anybody will ever say or do to me that changes how I feel about them. That's God's love. That's indebtedness.